Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you are doing. We pray that, Lord, you let your word be spoken here today. Nothing more and nothing less. Holy Spirit, I ask, Lord, for you to guide and to lead me and to lead us in the direction that you will have. I pray, speak unto us. I pray, teach us. I pray that, Lord, you would walk with us and show us how to live with you and for you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. John chapter number nine, verses one to three is our place where we're going to begin today. And we're going to have a look at one man and one miracle. And the reason we're going to be looking at this story in particular is because of what happened yesterday when I went outside on the streets of Birmingham. Now, I wasn't going out there to evangelize. Actually, I was trying to go to the library to sit down and to read and just to go over this message in my head and my heart. But when I got to Birmingham City Council and the library, guess what? It was shut. 5 p.m. on a Saturday, it shuts. Um, what good is it having a nice new library if it's not open? Anyway, let's get out there. Let's get back into the text. Now, Jesus passed by. Here he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Let's just stop there. Remember we spoke last week about people having this idea that if a bad thing happens to you, it's because you've done some terrible thing and karma is coming back upon you. And I, I hate that saying of karma, but that's what I'm going to call it because they weren't thinking correctly. Exactly the same thing's happening. They have this idea that any sort of ailment or disability is the result of sin. That is not the case whatsoever. In this passage, it tells us that this man was born blind, not because of his sin or because of his parents, but that the works of God could be revealed in him. God had allowed this man to be in that place for God's purpose and God's glory. I know people that are a walking testimony of the glory of God, their conditions that they have been born in or that they have found themselves fall into has caused them to have to lean on God. It's caused their families to have to be people of prayer and discipline and structure. And I sometimes look at that and I think to myself, has God put that in people's life so they could show the world that living by faith is something that's glorious and that shows that God's at work despite what some people might see as a disability or a shortcoming. I think sometimes God does this. Paul the Apostle in the scriptures, the Bible says that he had a thorn in his flesh. There was this struggle. He is this great evangelist, apostle, a preacher. And this is thorn in his flesh that really hinders him from doing the work of God at times and it frustrates him and I've often wondered what this form of the flesh might be he calls it a messenger of Satan to try and keep him humble or to and that tries to hinder him to some extent but it doesn't because he doesn't allow that form in his flesh to stop him now, many theologians and teachers of the Bible have debated about the fawn in the flesh. One thing that we know about Paul the Apostle was considering the man wrote so many books of the New Testament, we know he had a problem with his eyesight. In fact, when we read about some of the things that people said about Paul, one person says, I would have plucked out of my eyes and given them to you if it would have been possible. We know that Paul, the big Bible writer of the New Testament, had a problem with his eyes and had a problem with his sight, but yet God was using him profoundly. I love that. I wonder how many people he prayed for, for healing for their sight, but yet he himself was struggling in that area. Don't think that you were qualified because you are better than anyone else. No, you're qualified because the grace of God abounds upon you and God's chosen you for his purposes. Let's keep going. Verse four. And when he had said these things, so this is Jesus, he spat on the ground and made clay with his saliva and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. Let's pause. What a method of miracles and healing. Now, when you go to a doctor, the first thing that they do is they tend to wash you and make everything sterile and clean you down before they do any sort of procedure. They want to make sure it's clean and a sterile environment. Not God, not Jesus. No, no, no. 
God has no problem with working with the mess of your life and the mess of someone else's life. In fact, that's holy water right there. The spit of Jesus is being used. A little bit of mud, he's making a bit of clay, he's making the face mask of God. And with that face mask, he's going to anoint his eyes and God is going to do a healing miracle. Sometimes miracles don't happen the way that we think that they should. Sometimes it's not always clean and polished. God works with us messy people. I'm a mess, God works with me. Hallelujah. And he said to him, go and wash in the pool of Shilom, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back saying, hallelujah, go and wash. It's, Jesus didn't even finish it there and then. He spat on the floor, wipes it in the guy's eyes, and then he sends him away still blind. Now go find that pool of water. I mean, I look at this and I smile and I laugh and I think to myself, God, what were you doing? Maybe Jesus didn't want it to be too easy. Maybe he wanted that man's faith to have a part there was a journey for him to make in faith it's not enough that you've got the master putting his hands to his mouth and touching you and putting clay on your faith there's still oftentimes in miracles a part for us to play there is something for you to do there's a journey that you have to walk out so it continues therefore the neighbors and those who had previously seen that he was blind said, is, um, is not this who was sat and begged? They remember this man as a blind beggar. And everyone is now kind of losing their mind. Oh, my gosh. That blind man isn't blind anymore. He sees. Do you remember when we were in that prayer meeting where Leanne's eye was open? And the first thing we heard is, I can see, I can see. And all of a sudden, as we were praying in Albury, everyone was just like, in uproar, like, yeah, and that praise came out, and no one had to tell anyone to praise God. The place just erupted when God opened her eyes and reversed the medical condition that she was suffering. Everybody knew what God had done in that moment, and it was just wild. And I imagine that is what happened here. When God does miracles, everybody gets excited. Some said, This is He, and others said, he is like him. He said, I am he. Therefore, they said to him, how is it that your eyes are open? They don't get it. Like, you don't just turn up one day and you can see when a couple of minutes earlier you couldn't see. They're questioning it. Verse 11. And he answered and he said, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go wash in the pool of Shilom and wash. So I went and washed, and I received sight. Then they said to him, where is he now? And he said, I do not know. I like how nice he is about this. You know, he made clay. No, he didn't make clay. He spat on the ground. He spat on the ground, and he used that to make some dirty, clay kind of texture. But he just he spares all those details, and he makes it seem a little bit more dignified when he goes to tell the people of his day about this miracle. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this story and the reason it's on my mind is because as I was in Birmingham City Centre yesterday, I bought a tortilla wrap, I ate that, I left my phone in the shop, somebody was kind enough to run and give it me back, thank you Jesus. I went to the library, it was locked, it was raining, I happened to have a brolly, I walked down to New Street and I saw some Christians who were out evangelising and preaching and so I stood next to them for a little while and I just thought I'd get chatting with another Christian guy. Um, I planned to read my Bible, there was nowhere to sit, so I may as well talk to a Christian guy. And let's just see what comes of this for a few minutes while I'm waiting in the city centre. Lo and behold, as always, when Christians go out evangelising, they're doing well, normally somebody comes along to bog them down in conversations that are going nowhere. And so that's what happened. A group of Muslim men came and had very dignified and very calm conversations with them. But it just stopped them and it prevented them from being able to share what they were doing, which was their faith. And the conversations went from those conversations that were stirring, that were touching hearts and were causing people to believe, to arguing over details and facts and small issues that were never going to go anywhere. And it was a little bit frustrated, but I just stood and watched because I wasn't directly involved with this. I was just there as a witness, passing time, just watching and praying quietly. <laughs> One of the Muslim people turned around and said, 
where in the Bible does Jesus say, I am God, worship me? <sighs> and so I stood there and I was like, oh my gosh, these kind of questions. Because I know these questions oftentimes, it might sound like a really good biblical question, isn't it? It might seem like a good challenge to search your Bible for. Let me tell you this. There's a lot of people's questions that don't go anywhere. You can answer that question a thousand and one times. In fact, we're going to answer it today. But if we stop there with the service, you would get nothing from the service. Because answering questions from people that ask questions is not always helpful. I'm just going to say it outright. It isn't always helpful. And so I'm stood there and I'm listening and the question's being answered and all sorts of back and forth happening. And I'm on the streets and I'm just like, Lord, why am I here? What are you doing? And God spoke to me and said, Luke, they're asking the wrong question. You can answer this question, but when people answer the wrong question, they don't get the right answer. You can answer this question completely, thoroughly right. It's not going to achieve what I want to achieve in their life. It's the wrong question. And it reminds me of the next part of this passage in John 9, verse 15 to 18. It reminds me of what was going on with the Pharisees and the religious teachers. Bearing in mind, these Muslims came there, came to these Christians already knowing what the Bible said. The Christians were there preaching. They already knew what the Bible said. And so there was this pointless exchange, an exchange of information, but not an exchange of faith. There was nothing fruitful produced. Let's read. The Pharisees, that was the religious teachers, the Jewish religious teachers, also asked him again. So they've already asked him once. They're coming back to ask the man that had been healed from his blindness, this question, and asked him again how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put clay on my eyes and I washed and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. Stop. There's one detail here that's interesting. The guy that did the miracle did it on the wrong day. Jesus did a miracle on the wrong day. You know, God's not able to do a miracle on the Sabbath. Yeah, you know, God has to rest on the Sabbath. You shouldn't even get out of bed. It's the Sabbath, don't do anything. God's not able to work on the Sabbath day. This is their understanding of the Bible. This is their understanding of the scriptures. They have read the Bible. They read that God rested on the Sabbath day. And now when something dramatic and a miracle happens, they can't give God the credit because it's the Sabbath day and God has to rest on a Sabbath day. This is the kind of place that I worry that we can get ourselves into as believers. People that know the scriptures can get ourselves into these places where we view everything so much through the lens of this said that, it said this, it said that, that we can no longer see right and wrong and we cannot see common sense. Common sense has gone out of the window. God can do whatever he wants to do on any day that he wants to do it. If God wants to rest, he can rest. If God wants to rest by allowing someone else to see and rejoice him on a Sabbath day, then so be it. But there's no restrictions upon God. And I think it's bad that people are using the Bible to try and place restrictions on what God can do on what given day. Let's keep going. So where was I? Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Let's stop there. It's not enough to limit God. Then they're limiting Jesus. Oh, Jesus is a man. No man should do anything on the Sabbath day. <sighs> really? Do they not teach on the Sabbath? Do they not go to the synagogue in the Sabbath? Do they not help people on the Sabbath? Why would it be wrong to heal someone on the Sabbath day? They're looking for any excuse to not believe. They've gone asking a question, and it appears that they want to know the answer so that they can come to faith. But in reality, they're asking questions so they can find some little detail to give them a reason to not believe. We live in a world today where there are many questions, and some of those questions that are being asked are so people can find an excuse to not believe. Others said, how can this man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division amongst them, even amongst the people that came challenging 
challenging the miracle that had been done, challenging this man who had his eyes opened and now he can see. Even amongst those that were challenging, there was a division because some people could see with common sense and they had a problem. There was a logical problem. They couldn't comprehend how something good could happen. And some people could turn around and say it wasn't from God. The Bible says that all good things come from God. Amen. The father of all, he is the one that gives every good gift. But yet people had become blinded to it. Now. 17 and 18. They said to the blind man again, what do you say about him? Because he opened your eyes and he said, he is a prophet. The man that's had his eyes opened, he thinks he's a prophet. He's from God. He's doing the work of God. I know who he is. He's a prophet. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. He's in the right place. I've experienced what God's done in my life. I'm giving him praise. He's a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. Now, this is mad. One man has been powerfully touched by God. Woohoo! Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! The people that have seen him, they won't even accept what he's saying. Oh, you were never blind. You were never blind. Find me his parents. Let's confirm that this man is a liar. Uh, they meet his parents and like, okay, we have a problem. He might be telling the truth. Um, this is a little bit awkward. They're looking for any excuse to not believe. I'm on the street yesterday and that question was answered. But guess what? They were looking for any excuse to not believe. And the hardness of their hearts, it hurt me. It, it did something in me. It broke something in me. As I stood there, I was just saddened. Forget the rain and the miserable weather and the library not being open. I just stood there and watched in mis well, in unbelief of what I'm seeing. I'm like, I can't believe this is happening. I genuinely was stunned. I'm like, how can people be so willing to be so blind? One of the guys was actually arguing with the Christian, and the Christian says, I'm not even going to open my Bible. And the other guy was there, as he was asking him questions, going onto YouTube, typing in questions, listening to people teaching what they believe to try and counter this guy's points. In real time, I'm stood there and I'm like, the guy's on YouTube trying to undo what the person's saying. Why is he in the conversation if he doesn't want answers? And I wonder how many people there are in the world right now that want to entertain a conversation to waste people's time. You know why the enemy does that? Because you could be reaching somebody else. Because you could be finding someone that is open and that is ready to understand and to receive. Sometimes he can be doing it to test us. People like that help me greatly in my faith. Let me explain. They asked me questions that I didn't know the answers for because they knew the Bible better than me. And guess what? Sometimes they got the better of me on the day and I went home with my tail between my legs and I opened my Bible and I said, Lord, show me, teach me, train me. The questions that people asked made me a Bible student. In fact, going to work, I had a lot of pressure. I became a Christian. Everyone knew I was a Christian. My lunch break, I would try and read my Bible. That wasn't the case. I'd open my Bible and then it was free for all on Luke. Everyone versus Luke. Ask him a Bible question. Ask him anything about any chapter, any book in the Bible. You're a Christian. You should know it. You're a Christian. You should know it all. Isn't it weird how these unrealistic expectations come upon you? You're a Christian. You are going... That means you're a preacher. That means you're a pastor. That means you're an evangelist. That means you know everything about God. That means that your prayers should be answered. All of a sudden, you can't do anything wrong. There's this perfect standard expected of you. Isn't it hilarious? Don't be fooled. You are but human beings. We will make mistakes. You are allowed to tell people, I don't know the answer. And guess what? There are some questions that people ask of you. You say, I'm going to look into it. And they'll come back to you a week later. And you'll be like, I still don't have the answer but I'm still a believer. It's allowed. And you know what? When you do something wrong and they point it out, you'd be like, it's okay. I serve a very merciful God and I'm on a path and I will get it together and we'll work it out together in time. I'm not going to be perfect. Don't allow the judgments of people to crush you because we're not meant, we're not meant to be perfect Christians here on earth. God is helping us to become something but we're never going to be the full deal while we walk on this earth. There's a day coming at the resurrection where we're raised up from the grave. We meet him in the clouds. We'll have our clothes changed. All of a sudden then, I'm not going to be tempted anymore. 
All of a sudden then, I'm not going to desire the things that are wrong anymore. All of a sudden then, I ain't going to feel anger anymore. I'm going to be overcome with his love and his joy and his presence. At that point only, will Luke be a perfect Christian? And at that point only, will our struggles and our hardships end? And guess what? At that point, every tear should be wiped away from your eye. I'm telling you, there's, there is a perfection to come, but don't let anybody make you feel bad right now for not being perfect. You are not going to be perfect. And so we stood on the streets and they kept saying, prove to us that Jesus said, I am God, worship me. And I'm like, why do they need exact wording? Why do they need that? And I was doing my head in. And so I thought to myself, well, this passage proves that Jesus is worshipped. And the next chapter proves that he is God. So I thought, let me just show them. And so that's what we did. I thought, I haven't got time for this. They're annoying me now. Let's give them a quick answer and let's move on. And so we did. Verse 24, please. So again, they called the man who was blind and said to him, God, give God the glory. He'd already given God the glory. He was already praising God about what had happened. It was them that weren't. And we know not, we know that this man is a sinner. And then he answered and said, so this is the man that was healed. He answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. But the one thing I know was that I was blind and now I see. I, come on. The simplicity of faith is sometimes so important. It's not about all that you do know. Was he perfect? Was he not? I know what happened to me and I know what I experienced with Jesus. Next verse. They said to him again, what did he do to you? And how is it that he opened your eyes? And the blind man, he answered them, I told you already, and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? He's getting frustrated now. He now realizes that this conversation is pointless. This is where I was last night. Do you also want to become his disciples? Question mark. He knows what the answer is already. He's just asking them clearly so that there's no confusion here. They reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are Moses's. We're better than you. We follow Moses. You only follow this Jesus guy. And we don't even know where he came from. This is the kind of attitude that people get into. We know that God spoke to Moses. He did. God spoke to Moses face to face like a friend of him. For this fellow, we do not know where he is from. Well, if they had really known who Moses had spoken to, they would know that Moses was speaking to God on the top of the mountain and the person that he met in the clouds in that mountain when he spoke to God was Jesus. But they didn't see that. We follow Moses. Well, I follow the one that Moses spoke to. Mm. You know, you see, this is, sometimes people get so caught up in what they're trying to use to deflect away from personal responsibility for having a relationship and for having faith with God. And they're just pushing back over and over again. The man answered and said to them, why, um, why this is a marvelous thing, do you not know where he is from, yet he has opened your eyes? Never blaming the guy like, what do you mean he opened your eyes? You mean you let someone heal you, even though you didn't know where he was from? Well, I didn't really have very much choice in it. He, he anointed my eyes with clay, and he told me to wash, and I was healed. It's not like he had a part to play in. I prevented him from healing. Oh, it's, oh, I'm sorry. It's, so, it's all my fault. I should never have let that man heal me. It's, but they're blaming the guy. The frustration of these people has become too much. Verse 31. Now we know that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is a worshipper of God, and does his will, he hears him. Oof. Now, I'm going to be careful with that statement because it's an interesting one. God does hear people that call out to him. I'll say this, though. God answers the prayers of a righteous, and God delights in answering the prayers of his children. There's a special relationship that believers have, which means that we have a clear access to God. But that doesn't mean that people that don't know God, when they cry out to him, he's going to be like, no, nope, no, 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 don't hear you, la, la, la. God's not like that. God does delight in answering the prayers of people that believe in him. 
But there's also a truth to say that sin can have a way of separating us from God. But this man isn't trying to make an excuse for, for being separate from God. They're trying to say, you know what, we're better than you. God speaks to us and he doesn't speak to you. There's no reason for this to happen to you. You're not on our level. 32. Since the world began, it has been unheard that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. Amen. It's a miracle. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered and said to him, you were completely born in sins and you were teaching us. And they cast him out. It's amazing, isn't it? You're not qualified. Can I just say something? You don't have to be qualified to speak for God. They got this completely wrong. The prophets weren't qualified. They just spent time with God. They spent time in prayer. God spoke to them and they responded and they answered. And they build a catalogue and a history of responding and hearing and knowing God. Where in the Bible does it say that anyone became qualified to speak with God? It doesn't happen. Oftentimes God spoke and they said, here I am, here I am. Other times God spoke and they were fearful and an angel had to come and say, you know what, you mighty man of valor, come on, God's with you. Or Joseph had to be warned and spoken to just to encourage him, don't do anything that you're going to regret with Mary. You know what, she's a good woman. What's conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. It's a miracle that she's having a baby. God spoke to people, not because they were qualified, but because he wanted to speak. And as they got used to hearing the voice of God, all of a sudden, everybody else recognized their authority because they spent time with Jesus. Same thing's true with you guys. As you spend time in the presence of God with Jesus, you will hear him. He will guide you. He will help you. He will show you things. And in the pursuit of that and on that purpose, you will find that other people respect what you have to say regarding God because the evidence of God in your life is all around you. People know that when you pray, God answers. People know that when you speak about the Bible, that's the truth of it. People know that when you go into a place of sin, you don't get muddied up with it, but you keep an arena and you keep yourself with a dignity that they don't know how to do. And this man has the same dignity. And so now they're pushing him away and they're bringing an attack against him because all he wants to do is to praise God. He doesn't want a theology lesson. He just wants people to know God has taken me from a blind man to a man that sees. What's sad about this story is these religious teachers are the ones that think that they can see, but they are blind. And it's the blind man here, the one that understands what God is doing and is able to see clearly and praise God. And the simple childlike faith, common sense approach, and God is on the move. <coughs> they cast him out. Let's keep going, Bernie, please. 39, is it? Jesus heard that they had cast him out. So they kicked him out of the temple. And when he had found him, he said to him, do you believe in the son of God? And he answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have seen both him and he is who is talking to you now. Then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. This man, when he asked the right question to the right person, got the answer that said that Jesus is Lord. And at that moment, he fell down on his knees and he began to worship him. Jesus does not say, don't worship me. This is the first part of the answer to the questions of those men on the street. Where does Jesus say, I am God, worship me? Well, here he says, I am Lord and he's worshipped and Jesus isn't trying to stop him. Okay, okay, so he was worshipped there, but he doesn't say, I am God. He says, I am Lord. Okay, okay. All right, you want to see where Jesus is God then? All right. Let's go to John chapter 10. And there's a little passage there where Jesus proves that he's God. John 10 verse 32 reads, Jesus answered them and said, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of these works do you try to kill me or stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For what good work? For a good work, we do not stone you or try to kill you. 
but for blasphemy and because you being a man make yourself God. Stop. Blasphemy is to lower the name of God, is to speak negatively of God. It is to lower God's reputation and status. They're accusing Jesus here of blaspheming the name of God because he is claiming that he is God. Thus, in their mind, he's lowering the standards of God. Everybody see that? Let's keep reading on that. Being a man, you, for a good work, we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them and said, it is, is it not written in your law, I said that you are God's? Verse 35. If he called them God's to which the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said that I am the son of God? 37, please. If you do not believe the works of my father, do not believe me. But if, but if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the father is in me and I am in him. Let's just stop. Jesus said, these people are trying to blaspheme me. Jesus is, they're saying to Jesus, you've blasphemed. Jesus is there saying, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. If you've seen Jesus, you have seen God. If you want to know the Lord, then guess what? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is saying, if you've met me, then you have met God. And their minds are boggled and exploding. So now these people rightly choose to accept that Jesus is claiming to be God. And so what do they try to do? Kill him. And I'm on the streets and we're talking and we're getting nowhere because the second that we prove Jesus is God, they were like, yeah, but Jesus wasn't really God. That's why they tried to stone him. I'm like, but that's what you asked me to prove. But the Jews didn't accept that. We know the Jews didn't accept it. The Bible says that. But that's what Jesus has said. That's what he's claimed. That's what they understand that it. Jesus is Lord. Sometimes you can answer questions and get nowhere. So it kind of brought me back to something that was asked at the Bible study on Wednesday. Wednesday night we were there and the question was asked of me, how, what, what, what does God want of me? What does God want of me? I want God to show me how I should behave, how I should live, how I should relate to people. And when the lady said it, I think it was Sophie, her words just struck me because it, there was such a pure and innocent question that was being asked. It wasn't anything trying to escape anything. It wasn't anything theological. She just wanted to know what is it about Christians that makes Christians who they are, who they claim to be. And I like questions like that because we can learn a lot from them. You see, I was thinking about all sorts of different ways I could answer that. And the one thing that just struck me was Christianity is a relationship with God. Now, we have to be careful about what the relationship with God looks like because so many of us think that relationships don't have rules. <laughs> they do. There are boundaries to relationships. When you break someone's boundaries in a relationship, guess what? You're getting the cold shoulder. If you break a relationship too far, it's gone. You will never be together again. If you're married and you cross a certain boundary of that wife or that husband and you go too far, they may choose to never accept you back again. Relationships have boundaries, and the relationship that we have with God, too, has boundaries. But I'll tell you one thing it also has. It has an unbounding, everlasting, amazing, agape love that goes beyond everything else that we can imagine. Even when you think you've broken every rule and every boundary, we serve a God that's so loving that he dares to reach beyond the boundary and pull you back anyway and say, I'm going to give you another chance. This is the God that we serve. And I'm thinking about this woman's question about relationships. How do we relate? What does it mean? She's not yet a Christian and she's asking this wonderful question. What does God want from me? And how should I relate to other people as a Christian? How should I love people? How sh and I'm, I want to give her so many answers, but in the back of my mind, I'm like, I don't want to teach it as a theology lesson. There are some things that need to be experienced as you walk with God. 
You see, when you come into problems with, in your friendships, in your relationships, in your family members, with your employees, as a Christian, we fall down on our knees and he helps us and he strengthens us and we pray. And I tell you, one of the most hard things when God doesn't give you any more strength, any more power or the answers that you want, God doesn't change them. And you realize the only option is for, to allow God to change your heart. And you realize that you're going to have to put up with their nonsense and their drama and their issues. But God's going to change you subtly so that you're able to cope with it and overcome it and to stand despite their shortcomings and issues. And guess what that does? Everyone around you now realizes that no, nothing else has changed, but you've changed. People see that that was the hand of God. See, if your manager had changed, they'd be like, oh, look how much of a better person she is. But when you change, you become a witness that God is working in and through your life. You see, sometimes God changes people dramatically and easily. I was speaking to Evan about addiction. He was an addict. God delivered him once, powerfully. Whoosh. Didn't have any desire for it. But then he speaks about a time of a relapse. Guess what happens then? Is it a quick deliverance? No. There was a battle for God in his life after his daughter passed. There was this battle for him to do what was right and to go that battle and go that journey. Listen, sometimes... God does it instantly. Other times, God wants to walk it out with you. When I think about the disciples, Jesus was spending his whole life trying to teach them how to walk according to the faith, calling them to stand out on the waters. And I know I'm going to hear some funny stories about people walking on waters from that boat trip. <laughs> but I'm telling you this. Without the obstacle of the waters and without someone to call you out into the impossible, you aren't walking on waters, you're not sinking, you're not crying out for help. When you're in the boat, you're not learning anything. Sometimes those journeys have to take you into uncharted space where you would find difficulty that would stretch you and that would help you. But I promise you this, when you get into a time of need, if you ask Jesus, his hand reaches and he will lift you out. But he wants you to know that there are steps that you can take and there are waters and challenges and impossibilities that you can go through with. You see, Jesus, when he was trying to teach personal relationship, he taught them all sorts of lessons. Some of it, he did teach us a bit of theory, but the theory has to be applied. He taught the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, blessed are those that mourn, blessed are the peacemakers. He's teaching these concepts, but it only becomes real when you try to apply them in your everyday life. And the power isn't from quoting them as an excuse for unbelief like some people did, but where you try to apply what Jesus is speaking to see the power and the strength of it in your life to transform and to change you. We are right now walking this world, trying our best to live like Jesus. We're trying to imitate and to copy him. He went to the cross and denied himself. I'm trying to deny myself and let my mind be transformed by the things that he taught and by the way that he lived. This relationship's changing me. You ever had a bad girlfriend? I wasn't always saved, and I'm going to say this right now. I had one ghetto girlfriend. I know, I know, it's hard to believe. There's nothing ghetto about me. I know, I know, it's hard to believe, but it was bad. I was walking around in all black, night tracksuit, black K-Swiss tongue twisters. <laughs> she was walking around in a Lock 29 tracksuit, ghetto. I'm telling you, everything about that woman was ghetto and it made me ghetto and it was really funny because you know what? That's what relationships do to you. They change you. They have a way of making you better or worse, amen? So it is when we walk with Jesus. When you get to know him, when you walk with him, he will make you more like him. He will, your heart will love the things that he loves and it will hate the things that he hates. And you might get into a place of conflict where there's a little bit of a disagreement between the two of you. And then now you get a beautiful place. Now someone needs to change. <laughs> I'm going to say something interesting about God. It's hard to argue with him. <laughs> he's been from the beginning of time and he's not changing. God is not a man that he has to change. So when we get into those places with God, we can be hit, stuck between a rock and a hard place. Because I promise you this, 
The problem is always you. But this is where we get to with God, but, but God's so nice about it. So I'll, I'll wait for you. I've got eternity. I'll wait for you. And his patience, it's, it's mind-numbing. In fact, sometimes you'll look back at the times where you've been in disagreement with God, and you'll be like, God, really? I wasted a year, maybe two, and you waited. You were still there looking for me. After all that time, God, I, I went and did X, Y, and Z, and you waited for me. This is the power of a relationship to transform you. Because the worse and the longer you leave things, the greater you realize his love, his mercy, and his care is for you. And how much more willing he still is to reach into you. Because if it was you, the longer you'd left it, the more likely you are to never go back. With God, the longer you leave it, the more desperate he is for you to return. And it's just so different. The world's upside down with God. Jesus walked around and he taught the disciple about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God's not like this world. We just saw a president of the United States get, well, tried to be assassinated. I think God saved him. I actually do think God saved him. I just don't think we're ever going to leave it there. But you know, it's interesting when you see Donald Trump stand humbly and say, it was the grace of God. To God be the glory. I'm not meant to be here, but by the grace of God. You know, it's profane when Donald Trump seems to be humble and listening. Like you can say all your things you want, whether you're for him or against him. But this man stood still and for the first time ever was humbly standing and presenting himself like a man that was just in awe of the fact that he's still here because he felt like it was the work and the hand of God. We need that in our life sometimes. We have to go through these experiences together with God. Those experiences can be really small. It could be something as simple as learning the Ten Commandments and looking at them and discovering what they mean and saying, God, what do I do with this? What do I do with this? Every time we, we learn something about the Bible, every time we learn something about God, it's meant to have an application in our life. I'm terrified that there are questions being asked and answered and people are not learning from them. That's not what's meant to happen in the relationship. If you learn, if someone answers your questions, you're meant to learn something from them so that you can be a better person. But we live in a world today where answers and information do not result in change. It's crazy, absolutely crazy. Everything that God's revealed in this book, everything, was put there so that we could be better people. It was put there so that we could hold a better relationship with God. But somewhere along the line today, people don't want to hear. Let's talk quickly about hearing from God. I believe that every Christian wants to hear from God. Who in here wants to hear from God? Raise your hand. I know we all do. You know what that takes? It sometimes takes a place of risk and obedience. You know the place where I learned to hear from God most? When I started stepping out when God spoke to me. And guess what? I very quickly realized when it wasn't God. Very quickly. In fact, one of the things that more recently God has had to teach me was how to hear when he says no. <laughs> uh, amen. And I'll tell you this. I'll tell you why I didn't like it. I didn't hear it. Because I never wanted to hear God say no. I, you know, you don't want to hear that answer. And so you don't hear it. But very quickly, I've began to realize that sometimes God says no. And sometimes you will hear it. Sometimes you can be a bit more stubborn and you have to feel it. Last night, I went home. In fact, on the bus on the way home, Rayma, you'll be there. I started to have a headache and I started to see lights dazzling in the corners of my eye. And I was like, oh, I'm getting a headache. I went home and I went to bed. I closed my eyes and I could feel the pressure behind my head. And I'm just like, and I started trying to rebuke it like, like it was the enemy. Lord, I take, take this thing from my mind. If it's the enemy, Lord, let this attack stop in Jesus' name. And I lied there and nothing happened. I did it again just for good measure. Nothing happened. And I lied there. I got up. I took a couple of paracetamol and I went back to bed. I woke up in the morning at about 2 a.m. And I was like, the headache had gone. And I stopped and I, was like, I prayed and I was like, God didn't want me to say that message that I was going to preach today. But because I didn't want to hear it, God had to get my attention for a means that I didn't like. I went for a job interview once, 
I applied for a job, everything looked fine. I thought to myself, I'm guaranteed to get this job. The day before the job interview, guess what? I was bed bound. The day of the interview, I dragged myself to that job interview. I'm going to get that job. I'm going to get that job. I don't even think I was fit to drive my car. I turned my head and the room was spinning. I don't know how I was driving, but I went for the interview anyway. Didn't get the job. I'm not surprised I didn't get the job. I was walking up the stairs when they gave me a tour of the school, holding onto the rail like this. They're probably thinking this guy is all over the place. He's not fit to be here, let alone work here. Um, but because we don't want to hear God say no. Paul didn't want to hear God say no. Don't think you're in bad company. Paul wanted to plant a church. He wanted to touch into a nation. And God had to close the door on him to stop him from going there. Because Paul being that kind of a man, he would have went there anyway. And he would have done the work for God. But God said, no. Experience. The experiences that we have with God teach us and refine our discernment about when God is saying yes and when God is saying no. We learn different ways that God will speak to us. There will be people in here God will speak to with dreams. If you know me, I do not dream ever. It's impossible for me to say God speaks to me through dreams because at this moment he doesn't. But maybe in the future he will. But there'll be people in here that you have the most vivid dreams where God is speaking to you and you write them down and you pray about them and put them to the test and you will quickly begin to discern which are your own dreams from too much thoughts and imagination and which of those that were given by God. There'll be other people in here as you're praying things come to your mind pray into them ask God about them God will confirm or God will be mute and silent about things and you'll quickly begin to receive and perceive when God is speaking to you and when God is not. But we've got to practice our discernment because otherwise God will speak and the whole lot can go straight over our head. I think we live in a generation today where because of those people that quote the scriptures and that quote Deuteronomy that speak that if you ever prophesy falsely, you're a false prophet and you're not of God. Because of that, I think that there's something that's stifled in a lot of people when it comes to stepping out in faith. And it results in people never being willing to ever step onto the water. But if you don't ever step on the water, you will never walk on the water. You will never do the supernatural. You will never do the impossible. Sometimes we have to step out. There is safety in wise counsel, but sometimes you have to take risk. Aaron's saying is that faith is spelled R-S. I spelled it wrong, didn't I? Okay, Aaron's a better speller than me. You heard that, Aaron? The faith is spelled R-I-S-K. Gosh, that's really hard to do. Sometimes that's how we need to live and that's how we need to work because you know what? God wants us to take risks and to believe God for the impossible. Our relationship with God will be boring if we don't do anything with it. If you don't go on a journey with God, if you don't step into the unknown, you might end up becoming a Christian with a life that just feels bland. Nobody wants to feel like a seat warmer. There are no seat warmers in the kingdom of God. There are children that have got great destinies and potentials. But that's not how you want to be remembered. You want to be remembered as the people that achieved so much, that raised your children in the way of faith, that inspired other people around you to believe. God is calling you to do great things. But it's down to us individually as to how we respond to what he's saying. On that note, can I get everyone to close their eyes and to bow their heads? Sadly today I've spoken a lot about people that would not hear from God. And I've showed you that there's the strategy that they took in scripture. I've only said it because sometimes... Showing people what not to do is the easiest option because there are so many options as to what you can do in this walk and the relationship with God. And I don't want to limit it because God's going to speak to you guys in greater ways than he speaks to me. And he's going to open possibilities that I have never even considered. There are some of you that when you're in the spirit, you will sing and you will draw and there will be artistic gifts. I can't draw. 
God's going to do those things in and through your life. You might even find that as you begin to sing and to draw and express yourself, God just begins to flow in a dynamic way that others don't have. You know what? Praise God. There are others in here that as you read the Bible, God's going to bring the words to life. And it might not even be in the context of that passage, but God's going to speak to you in a profound way. There'll be others that when you're in prayer, there'll be an audible voice. Others, you will get visions and pictures. There'll be others that God is just going to do powerful things and you're going to see visions and dreams. And there'll be others that, you know what? God is going to use you in dramatic unusual ways but it all comes from us leaning on that relationship we have with God and saying God I want to heal the blind God I want to see God I want to learn to be used of you to speak to the nations to speak to people so that they can have their doubts dissolved so that they might believe maybe you're in here today and you've never given your life to Jesus you've never said Jesus I want you to touch my life. I want you to invite me into your family. Lord, I want you to start a new work in me. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've made mistakes. But Lord, I, I want you to forgive me and I want you to bring me into the house of God. You're in here today and God's been speaking to you saying, enough with the unbelief, enough with the excuses, enough with the questions that don't lead anywhere I want to walk with you so that you know that you can trust me and believe with me, believe in me. And the more you walk with Jesus, the more reason he will give you to believe. I promise you this is all you have to do is start the journey and he will give you every reason to believe. He will answer your prayers. You will see that he is good. You will see that he is there for you. You're in here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, but you'd like to. Come to know Jesus. You'd like to follow him. Just put your hand up in the air and God will see that and God will answer you. Praise the Lord. I see that hand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Is there anyone else in here? Just before we move forward. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. For that person that raised your hand, I just want to pray for you. Father, I just pray Lord, for our brother, that, Lord, we thank you for the decision that he made here today. Father, I pray that, Lord, that you would touch him. I pray that, Lord, you would do a new work in his life. Lord, we pray that, Lord, you bring him from darkness into the glorious light. Father, I pray you speak to him. I pray that you move him. I pray that you inspire him. Lord, I pray that, Lord, that you would walk there beside him as a friend and gradually change him in the same way that you change me and you have everyone else in this room. Father, we thank you that we have a relationship with you and that, Lord, you're helping us move forward together with you. We praise you and we thank you for the blood. We thank you for your resurrection. We thank you for the price that you paid so that we could be freed from this world and that we could live for heaven. And Father, I just want to ask that, Lord, that you just welcome him into the family of God. Pour your Holy Spirit into him. Lead him and guide him. I pray for the voice of God to be made clearer and clearer and help him in those first days to take those first steps. Lord, till he gets his balance. And then, Lord, I pray, God, teach him to run, teach him to stand. Lord, raise him up as a man of faith. And I pray that, Lord, you bless him and his household and his family. I pray that, Lord, let your hand be upon him. I pray, Lord, let the enemy, let it not be able to hold him back. I pray, Lord, that every attachment and every attack of the enemy, let it come up to nothing for you work all things together for him now because he's called according to your purpose. I pray that Jesus, that you be magnified in him. Show him that he is strong enough to overcome the world for greater is he now that you live in his heart and in his life. In Jesus' name. We're going to hand it over to the worship team. Praise the Lord. Thank you.